And now for something lighthearted and fun. <laughs> Let's talk about the end of the world. Born in that swirling inferno of radioactive dust were things so horrible, so terrifying, so hideous. There is no word to describe them. All right. I was brought up on those. I was brought up in the 50s. In the 50s, uh, we, had, we were well into the nuclear age. Science unleashed this horrible monstrosity, atomic weapons, and all the movie makers started making things like that. We unleashed monsters. And so the sense is transformation. I wanted today to say that, in fact, some things, certain catastrophes, unleash something other than monsters. The permanent extinction of 250 million years ago was the greatest single mass death in the history of the planet. This is a painting by my friend Alexis Rockman. And we had 90% of all species go extinct, which should translate to 99.999 and plenty of nines of individuals. There were five big mass extinctions in the past. Only one of them, it turns out, this last one, is caused by meteoric impact. And so the last five years has really been trying to figure out what the other four are. And the reality now seems that the other four are all caused by global warming. Turns out oxygen and carbon dioxide have been going up and down through time. This is carbon dioxide. When it's high, it's hot, and when it's low, it's cold. This is a time of enormous ice ages. It's come up, it's gone down through here. But one of the aspects about carbon dioxide is it's opposite of oxygen. So the green here is the level of oxygen. The reason I showed the them is, in fact, here oxygen is about 35%, and it was the time of the largest insects and the largest dragonflies in the world. High oxygen was good times for everybody and everything, and then it all came to an end. So it turns out that about five or six times in the past, the earth, the core of the earth has burped, and in that burp, it has thrown up great gouts of magma. And I like the symbolism. They look like hydrogen bomb attacks through here. But this is our planet. This is a rendition from Berkeley. And we have removed the mantle of the Earth here. And all we see is the crust and the result of flood basalts. These are gigantic volcanic eruptions. You only have to go to eastern Washington to see what they're like. They are just lava everywhere. And actually, as a paleontologist, I really hate the Columbia River basalts. Because what have they covered up? All the good stuff. So you've got this really boring basalt, but what does basalt bring up to the surface with it? Carbon dioxide. Five times in the past, we've had carbon dioxide levels go from approximately a little bit above what we have now up to 1,000, 2,000, 2,500 parts per million. Right now, we're at 390, 393, I think, but it's going up now three parts per million per year. When carbon dioxide in the past has hit 1,000 ppm, there's trouble. The tropics cannot warm up anymore. They're as hot as they can be. The poles are warming up a lot. We see it, polar amplification. And when you have a warm poles and a warm tropics, currents stop. The ocean goes stagnant. Oxygen at the bottom disappears. And entirely new bacteria are produced. They rise to the surface. And they let out enormous quantities of toxic hydrogen sulfide. That kills things quite readily. So we, trying to look at the good side of things, we're doing all these her horrendous, awful, let's kill it now and see what level of hydrogen sulfide kills things, um, actually started thinking, and this is really the work of uh, Frederick Dooley and Suven Nair, who is actually in, in the audience now. It's like, if it doesn't kill you, maybe it does make you stronger. I never believed in that at all. But we started looking at low doses of hydrogen sulfide on plants. And the backstory for here, we've never presented this data before. The University of Washington found out about it and immediately took a patent out on it and said, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so this is going live right now. <laughs> Hydrogen sulfide does really funny things to plants. Turns out the photosynthesis works in two different ways. These are the wavelengths that plants are using for normal photosynthesis. There's two really important ways. There's photosystem one and photosystem two. They evolved at different times. But hydrogen sulfide makes a plant go from its modern type to a very ancient type. 
I mean, it has some really peculiar properties for things. And photosynthesis now, I'm sorry about the graphs and things, but right through here, the blue, this is a control. We've done experiments now. We started giving plants hydrogen sulfide. And what happens through here is that at this 68 micromolar, photosynthesis increases. We're looking at tiny, tiny little bits, bits of hydrogen sulfide and finding miraculous things taking place. This is the funnest of all. We just got a wheat crop that was 77% more than the controls. So we took it all the way, very low dose of hydrogen sulfide. At least a 77% increase in the world's wheat crop would actually do some very good things. The other aspect about it is it doesn't just work on wheat, it also works on moss. So these three were given hydrogen sulfide, these three weren't the same amount of time, and the moss is growing like crazy. And we're starting to see lots of interesting connections here. Mount St. Helens recolonized unbelievably fast. No one knew, why are the plants growing so fast? Low dose hydrogen sulfide, volcanics coming up through it. We started asking other questions, other things and started working on bees and beans and peas, and here we have growth rates of hydrogen sulfide. If we're using 10 millimolar here, here's your control. So once again, you're doubling plant growth outcrop. Too good to be true, but so far, it is true. It not only works on plants, it works on their seeds. And so if we start looking at controls here. In this particular case, these are just some seeds that have been put in water after 96 hours, and now let's give them the hydrogen sulfide. So it's a radically different phase going on here. It does something to cell sizes. So here's controls. We're looking now, we're looking right into a leaf, and each of these little green guys is a cell. So you give hydrogen sulfide, they become smaller, but they become many, many, many more of them. So I have a movie here. Let's see if we can run this one. So we've got a really short movie of a control. This is a seed, and this is a seed that's been given hydrogen sulfide. And right at the end of this, some really interesting stuff happens. So all of a sudden, this guy starts going crazy. Pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty cool. All right, why is this happening? <laughs> uh, we, we don't know. <laughs> but we're happy. So the why is it happening stuff is actually a very interesting question, and it goes back to the mass, mass extinctions themselves. It might actually be very simple. Hydrogen sulfide coming out was killing things like crazy. So at the end of the Permian, we have these oceans that are really anoxic and they're covered with bacterial scum and hydrogen sulfide is coming out of solution. Small amounts of hydrogen sulfide drifting into the atmosphere. And if you are a plant, you are more susceptible to dying from it if you're small. If you're a tiny little brand new shoot, you die at lower concentrations. Grow as fast as you can. And it seems to be as simple as that. Plants which can grow very fast might just survive this particular stuff. So that's all well and good. Uh, what else do we have to play with? How about biofuel and algae? So these guys over here, here's control. It actually is a slowdown effect on these are our poison stuff, supposedly poison. But at the end now, we've got this yield that's up 20, 30% over the other stuff. So a 20, 30% increase in biofuel would actually be revolutionary for this planet. Okay, um, why and where and how and what do we do next? The mass extinctions are hideous and horrible. My sister used to say that when I came on the radio once in a while in KUW, her coworkers would say, oh, here comes Dr. Doom. He's gonna really depress me. <laughs> and the depressing thing is that the events which caused this this global warming, we're at 1,000 parts per million. We're at 390 and gaining now. We are less than 200 years from hitting the level that causes ocean currents to start to stop. We're also seeing that when we have one of the largest temperature 
rises in history, and I don't know if you noticed yesterday, there's a new estimate now, we're looking about eight degrees by the end of the century. That's really not gonna do good things to the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, and that you will have storms like Sandy jumping off with their storm surge from higher elevations. We just can't afford as a society to let sea level rise. We can't afford to keep moving cities inward. And Sandy itself should be a wake-up call. And my fear is this society will do nothing until we get mass mortality from some accident coming out of a global warming scenario. So I think everybody in this room owes something to this planet, and much more so to the future generations. You know, we may be leaving a big debt in America, but it's our carbon dioxide debt. And I'm sincerely hoping that our president, now that he can't get reelected, will finally, finally, do something about climate change and emissions. Thank you. <laughs>